There's something that, that Paul said last night. Paul was asking these really hard questions about what is consciousness? Consciousness, what, you know, is it this? When does it start? When do I become conscious? Hard questions. It's like, I have answers, I don't have answers. It's like, yeah, or I don't have concrete answers. So I went home, and, and this is another way in which these meetings are really stimulating. You know, these are, these are all valid questions, and I don't have answers to those questions. And then I realized, but I do have the answer that I'm trying to share here in this seminar. And that is that, actually, we don't have answers in concrete ways. But we do tell stories. And aren't all of these answers that we have to the mystery stories in one way or another? And if there is a story that spontaneously makes sense across ages and ages of time, might it be that story has some validity. That maybe that story is worth our attention. And that maybe all the supposed concrete answers we give in their variability, in their dialectics, are plays upon themes in some of this story. So <clears throat> the psychology I've been trying to talk about here is, once again, a psychology among many psychologies. It's not singular. It's not the only truth. People have psychologies of different sorts which help them understand their life, make sense of their wounds, and <clears throat> get better. And look, if it has therapeutic potential for anyone, anyone, if that is what that person needs... Don't critique it. Understand it. Allow it. But there is a type of psychology which is appropriate more for some people. Some people are receptive to it. Jung's psychology, and I think also to a degree Hillman's, and you know, to a very large degree, Hillman's very much in the camp of Jung. I've come to appreciate Hillman a whole lot more in these last two years. I mean, I, for a long time I had problems with Hillman because I thought he misunderstood some things in Jung. And I've come to see he understood a whole lot. And towards the end of his life, in those last two years when he was talking to Sonu Shamdasani about the Red Book, the lectures, that, I mean, their talks that are re reproduced in their book, The Lament of the Dead, he really did open up and he saw lots of things that he had missed before. I came to really respect the man. <clears throat> this psychology, his archetypal psychology, the imaginal psychology, Jung's psychology, are a type, a domain of psychology. And people over the years have asked me, well, why are you so fixated on Jung? Why the hell are you just all this Jung, Jung, Jung stuff? Is, you know, Jung God? Is Jung, are you the minister, preacher of Jung? Well, okay, it's a fair question, and I've, <clears throat> I realize that this is peculiar. I mean, it's been pointed out to me by more than one person that I seem to be a bit centered here. Uh, I mean, I, look, I work with other doctors. They know that I do things like this, and they make fun of me all the time. <laughs> it is humorous. It's humorous to me. But what I wanted to try to share uh, in some way, I'm not focusing on Jung because Jung was like the brilliant man that finally brought us the authentic truth. Quite to the contrary. My interest in Jung is related to the fact that Jung represents a tradition, a human tradition, a way of seeing life, image, experience, dream, vision, religion, a way. That tradition is 2,000 years long. It's been interrelated, sure, with Judaism and Christianity, and Jung continued to point out it had interrelationships in Taoism, in Buddhism, it was a perception about life at a very deep level. So my 
my immediate uh, interest in Jung was not because I thought this guy had seen what no one else had seen. It's because I felt this guy was saying, one, something that resonated with the deepest perceptions I had, perceptions that had only really come to form through my life. It took me years to really realize what was going on inside of me that seemed in conflict with so many other things on the outside world, religion and theology being part of them. But realizing that Jung was part of my tradition. He was a a friend within my tradition. And within my tradition, he deserved recognition. Okay? He was part of my clan, my clan of the dead. We'll talk about that next month. So, session five, Remembering Sophia, C.G. Jung and the Sophianic Myth. So in November of 1960, seven months before his death, C.G. Jung suffered what he called the lowest ebb of feeling I have ever experienced. He explained the sentiment in a letter. I had to understand that I was unable to make the people see what I am after. I am practically alone. There are a few who understand this and that, but almost nobody sees the whole. I have failed in my foremost task to open people's eyes to the fact that man has a soul and there is a buried treasure in the field and our religion and philosophy are in a lamentable state. C.G. Jung, 1960, November 13. Looking back over the last half century and more, it appears Jung had reason to lament. He has not been wholly understood. But the cause lay not just in the sprawling scope and the complex tenor of his work. In retrospect, it is evident that Jung had not revealed the whole. During his life, Jung cautiously and consciously elected not to publicly share the experiential key to his vast opus. He knew it, too, would not, at least not then, be understood. The missing key we now see is his long sequestered Red Book, the work Jung formally titled Liber Novus, the new book. Begun when he was 38 years old and based on experiences carefully recorded in his journals between about 1913 and 1916, Liber Novus contains Jung's account of a life-altering journey into the depths of vision. At the commencement, he called his venture my most difficult experiment. For over 16 years, Jung labored at calligraphically transcribing, illuminating, a compilation from his journal record into the exquisite folio volume now known as the Red Book. And this was his buried treasure. It is a foundation of Jung's oeuvre, his work, and the Rosetta Stone to decode his subsequent hermeneutics of creative imagination. And now, nearly a century after its composition, the publication in 2009 of Liber Novus has instigated a broad reassessment of Jung's place in cultural and in psychological history. Among many revelations, the visionary events recorded there expose the experiential foundation of Jung's complex association with the Western tradition of Gnosis a perennial praxis he identified as the historical antecedent of his psychology. To understand the whole of Dr. Jung, it is imperative that we finally delve into the depths of his Gnostic vision. 
and the ways in which that ancient rhizome, that root, nurtured his life task. An understanding of visionary literature, particularly of Gnostic materials, and the myth of Sophia, is a crucial element to understanding Libra Novus. Those who attempt to understand this book, this new book, need to appreciate the nature and tradition from which it arises. <coughs> Excuse me. As Dr. Sonu Shamdasani stated at the Library of Congress in 2010, if, as Jung claimed, Dante and Blake clothed visionary experience in mythological forms, could we now not pose the question, did Jung in turn attempt to clothe visionary experience in conceptual psychological forms? Clothe visionary experience in conceptual psychological forms. If so, the power and significance of his work does not reside in his concepts, which are familiar to us, but in the visionary experience which was at the back of them. Dr. Sonu Shamdasani, in his address at the Library of Con- Congress in the year 2010. Over preceding decades, Jung's connection with Gnostic tradition received comment, and it generated controversy. Plentiful evidence regarding his sympathetic interest in Gnosticism appeared throughout his published writings. More evidence came in comments he made in his private seminars. And then there was a little book he had printed titled Septum Sermones Ad Mortos, Seven Sermons to the Dead, which at a very early date robustly signaled the Gnostic foundations of Jung's vision. And I read you the first entry passage of that Seven Sermons to the Dead when I was talking about the Pleroma in that first act of Sophia. Jung privately, privately printed the Septum Sermones Ad Mortos in 1916, shortly after their composition, and not long after their transcription into his journal. In 1917, Jung added these sermons, along with an amplifying Gnostic commentary spoken by his spirit guide, Philemon, to the final manuscript section of Lirinoas, where they stand as the summary revelation of his experience. Jung gave copies of this 1916 printing of the sermons to trusted students over many subsequent years. But these were always held privately. They were not meant for public circulation. With Jung's approval, uh, H.G. Baines, also known as Peter Baines, who was at that time Jung's principal assistant in Zurich, prepared an English translation of the seven sermons in the early 1920s. And again with Jung's approval, the English edition was printed by Watkins in London, privately, and was held for private distribution to Jung's students who did not speak German. Numerous individuals working with Jung in those early years eventually read his Gnostic revelation. Writing in 1950, Jung explained his situation 40 years earlier, at the time of the composition of the Seven Sermons, and at the threshold of the experiences that produced Libra Novus, just before this all broke loose. Jung said, The psyche is not of today. Its ancestry goes back many millions of years. Individual consciousness is only the flower and the fruit of a season, sprung from a perennial rhizome beneath the earth. 
and it would find itself in better accord with the truth if it took the existence of the rhizome into its calculations. For the root matter is the mother of all things. End quote. He recounts that his intense study of mythologies around 1911, and this is a few years before the Red Book stuff starts, his intense study of mythologies around 1911 forced him to conclude that without a myth, a human is, quote, like one uprooted, with no true link either to the past or with the ancestral life which continues within, or yet with contemporary human society, end quote. And then Jung continues, So, I suspected that myth had a meaning, which I was sure to miss if I lived outside it in the haze of my own speculations. I was driven to ask myself in all seriousness, what is the myth you are living? I found no answer to this question and had to admit that I was not living with a myth or even in a myth but rather in an uncertain cloud of theoretical possibilities, which I was beginning to regard with increasing distrust. So in the most natural way, I took it upon myself to get to know my myth, and I regarded this as the task of tasks. I simply had to know what unconscious or preconscious myth was forming me from what rhizome I sprang. End quote. And so, beginning on the night of 12 November of 1913 and continuing over the next several years, he confronted the portentous task of tasks. C.G. Jung stepped to the rim of the world where, as he declared, Quote, the mirror image begins. He called it, quote, a voyage of discovery to the other pole of the world. And he found his myth, the rhizome from which he sprang. He explained, as reported in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, the knowledge I was concerned with or was seeking still could not be found in the science of those days. I myself had to undergo the original experience and moreover, try to plant the results of my experience in the soil of reality. Otherwise, they would have remained subjective assumptions and without validity. In 1948, he described the event to Victor White, Father Victor White, the Dominican priest. And he said, in a letter to Victor, Quote, I wanted the proof of a living spirit, and I got it. Don't ask me at what price. End quote. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung explained his situation. At the time, he was completing the draft of Liber Novus, and this is in 1916 about. After this eruption of material between 1913 and 1916, He says, I had to find evidence for the historical prefiguration of my inner experiences. That is to say, I had to ask myself, where have my particular premises already occurred in history? If I had not succeeded in finding such evidence, I would never have been able to substantiate my ideas. Between 1918 In 1926, I had seriously studied the Gnostic writers, for they too had been confronted with the primal world of the unconscious and had dealt with its contents. Now, in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, it says he started this reading between 1918 in 1926, those dates always seem wrong to me because he was already talking about this Gnostic mythology in 1916 in the Seven Sermons to the Dead that he wrote. 
It seemed that he had had some association with this stuff earlier that had been playing with him. And so last year when I went to Zurich, this was one of the things I was trying to, to clear up. And um, Dr. Sean Dasani had noted, has noted that Jung's study of Gnostic materials actually began when he was on military service in 1915. This is a year after these visions started. Within a year of the time this stuff broke loose, Jung was looking in history. He was hunting in history for evidence that images, images such as the ones he had dealt with, the mythological story of image, had elsewhere occurred. Not only that images and imagination had occurred, that he knew. I mean, he was a psychiatrist. That his particular premises, the nature of the images he was meeting, which, as you'll remember, had a very strong feminine quality in the Red Book, um, had occurred. And it was at that point that he turned anew to a reading of the accounts of the ancient Gnosis. And now he approached the texts with a unique interpretive tool. He wasn't just reading these Gnostic texts flat, as were many theologians or historians of religion for the prior decades. He was bringing to his reading a reflected mythology of his own, you see. He was now approaching the texts with a most unique interpretive tool, a hermeneutics of understanding what had gone on with the writers of these texts. And what was that? It was his own experience of the prior two years. His experience led him to understand a type of mythology as a hermeneutic, a vision. Because that's what the Red Book is. It is his hermeneutic, his interpretation of what happened. He saw things, he heard things, and then he tried to give form to them in myth, in story, in image. In fact, the image itself had to speak. The words themselves had to speak in calligraphic forms. They had to speak in image. But you see, where did that begin? It began in this image that came to him on those nights, night after night, between November 13 and spring of 1914, and then again starting in the summer of 1915. And I've actually seen one of those journals. They're written, very simple, school book, cheap journals, <clears throat> page by page, in his careful hand. And those journals are going to be actually now published. They're being worked on right now. The translators are going to work on them right now. Sonu Shan Basan, he's already done a lot of work on this stuff. He had to go through all these journals when he was putting together the, the Red Book for publication. And in the Red Book... He included in the Red Book numerous footnotes taken directly from the journals. As he says, the journals are not a journal of dreams. There are no dreams in there. These are his visions with not too much commentary. And the visions as they are transcribed into the Red Book are almost precisely like they are in the journal. He didn't fiddle with it. What he then added was a commentary layer that he wrote within the year after the visions of his contemplations, his re-entry into them, trying to understand what was going on a reflected, consciously reflected mythology. This was the conscious reflection on myth, you see. So this period has been Jung's greatest enigma. He described it as the numinous beginning which contained everything, but until very recently, we have known next to nothing about it. So again, you have to consider what happened to him. Order the events temporally. And their formidable effects on him. The contemporaneous ledger, excuse me, the contemporaneous ledger of the visionary venture, as recorded in the journals known as the Black Books, began on the night of 12 November 1913. On that night, he had hit the wall. His conceptualizations, his theories were dead and he knew it. He did not know what he was doing. He felt he was being menaced by maybe a psychosis. Visionary material was spontaneously occurring in the prior month of an entire destruction of the European continent. He saw this vision twice while he was sitting on a train on the way to his mother's house, mother-in-law's house. And so that night, he threw it all to the wind. He sat at his desk, took out a journal he had not touched since 1911, 1901, in 11 years, and he wrote, My soul, my soul, where are you? 
That was the petition. He wrote those words in that journal that night. And he determined that he would wait and he would listen till he heard an answer. And he sat for days, 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 25, he says, nights in the desert, trying to hear something coming back. And slowly things did begin to come. That supplication led in the next few months to a flood of imaginative material. The vision he called the Mysterium, his encounter with Elijah and Salome, came in late December. Thereafter, new encounters constellated almost nightly. The Red One, Ammonius, Isdabar, the Eye of Evil, the horde of dead Anabaptists on their way to Jerusalem, and Jung's first meeting with Philemon, the magician. All of this erupted over the weeks from December to February of 1914. And then in August, but then in March, the visions abated, and by June, they ended. Come summer. In August of 1914 came the outbreak of the First World War. During the following months of late 1914 and early 15, Jung composed the first drafts of what would become the first and second book of the Red Book. The first two of the three completed sections of the manuscript. And thereafter, after he'd done this first recension, he thought he was done. All hell broke loose again in the summer, late summer of 1915. All of a sudden, Philemon came back and started a whole new series of visionary material. What I have determined, and with research, and I won't go into the details. If you're interested in the details of this, I, I put them in a forward to a book that was just published. It's called The Search for Roots, C.G. Jung and the Tradition of Gnosis. And it's written by a, a fellow by the name of uh, Alfred Ribby, the book. Uh, Ribby's an analyst at, at, in Zurich for 50 years. And then when I was in Zurich doing research on this, I met Dr. Ribby, and he asked me to help get this book published in English, and asked me to write a forward to the book, explaining my new research in Liber Novus, because he had written the book 10 years ago, before any of the Red Book stuff was available. And so I put in that forward uh, the documentary evidence about when Jung started reading Gnostic materials. And the result is, when he started reading them, in the fall of 1915. After he'd finished that first draft, he had this imaginal material, and then he went looking. Sham Dasani is shown, based on his journals from military service, it was 1915 he started reading this stuff, I went into his library and I actually found the book, that, the, the key book that he had read in this period. And it's underlined. It's the most underlined book in his entire library. He didn't underline books very often, not many at all. This one is just covered with marginalia. It just broke it loose. There's other evidence to that, but that, I put that in the, in the foreword. So in 1915, he finds this Gnostic material. And then shortly thereafter... He writes the seven sermons to the dead. And that last section is the summary revelation to Libra Novus. So in the months following the completion of the first two sections of Libra Novus, and before this second, last section, which is called Scrutinies in the Red Book, this entry into uh, his Gnostic readings began. And these went on from 1915 then for the next 13 years. Jung was studying Gnostic material, trying to make sense of what had happened to him. It was the place he first found an analog of his psychology. uh, Jung told Barbara Hanna, a close associate, Barbara Hanna was Jung's driver. I mean, she was an analyst and a dear friend. She was the daughter of an Anglican bishop in England. And uh, But she had moved to Zurich, and after the war, Jung didn't drive his car anymore, so Barbara was sort of his, you know, drove him around a lot and spent a lot of time with him and really knew Jung very well. Um, and she wrote a biography of Jung. It's one of the better biographies of Jung because although there may be some gossip in it, believe me, the gossip was firsthand. She, she was there in the car. She heard the gossip. So anyway, Barbara Hanna states that Jung told her, he, she states, he told me more than once that the first parallels he found to his own experiences were in the Gnostic texts. That is, those reported in the Elenchos of Hippolytus. Now, Elenchos of Hippolytus. Hippolytus was one of the ancient writers who compiled uh, a critique of Gnostic uh, psychology, mythology. 
Jung feels that Hippolytus must have been a closet Gnostic because he collected so much important primary material, including that text I read about Simon Magus. Hippolytus put this stuff in his book. But Hippolytus' writings, or Hippolytus, more properly stated, put this uh, material in his books, but his books were lost. He wrote in Greek in Rome in the 2nd, 3rd century, and these books were lost. They were not rediscovered until 1842 in Greece, in Mount Athos Monastery. And when these were found, it was equivalent to the find of the Nadj Hammadi Library to that period, because here was a huge cache of authentic excerpts from Gnostic material. It had really a, a revolutionary effect upon the very first, earliest phase of, uh, of uh, scholarship into Gnosticism. So Jung says that that's where he first found an image of his experiences. And no, he didn't say, I found an image, an analog of my concepts. He says, I found my experience in those texts. So the questions that came, and uh, that no one really had been asking, as best I could tell, was, one, when did he read Apollotus? And that's the first question I tried, and I think fairly well substantiated. He, he first read Apollotus in 1915 carefully and un- with understanding after the first phase of his visions. And then the second question is, what were the particular experiences that Jung would have found in Hippolytus? Well, the only way you'd know that is by reading the Red Book, the sections that had occurred to that point, and then reading all the stuff in Hippolytus and saying, what the hell is, is in here that Jung would have related to? And as best I could tell, no one had done that. I did. And I'll tell you, what he found. There are two myths. The myth of Sophia and the myth of Simon Magus. They're there. They are reflected in the Red Book. They are reflected in Jung's psychology. I've told you about the myth of Sophia a bit today. And I've told you a bit about the myth of Simon and Helen. Both tales subsequently entwined themselves in parts of Libra Novus composed after 1915, both tales flow, flow as a thread throughout his later psychology, throughout all his later work. So Sophia, the story of Sophia, and the seven sermons to the dead. When Dr. Shamdasani published the Red Book, he had no idea whether anyone would ever be able to see into this archives that he had had access to. He had the Red Book. The question was is how much to add to it. I mean, he could have just done a translation of the text of the manuscript and nothing more. What he did is spent 15 years of his life, essentially, collating this text with Jung's collected works, going through the archives, through the journals, taking pieces of the journals and showing where the journal, the Black Book material, adds into the Red Book. It was, it was an amazing labor. And people were bugging him, like, why don't you just get this thing done? They didn't understand that what he was doing was, as he said, this was not a rational undertaking. <laughs> he didn't know what the hell he was doing other than that he had to do it right, that something wanted this done right. And, of course, he didn't know how much of this stuff would ever be seen again, so he sank a great deal of supporting material, like the Black Book journals. He didn't know if the family would allow the Black Books to ever be published. It was a question whether the Red Book was ever going to finally make it to print while he was working on this project for 13 years. So he, into the footnotes, he put a lot of this material. And he added three appendices to Libra Novus. I don't know if anyone pays attention to them. They just knocked my shoes off, I'll tell you. Three appendices. Why the hell did he choose these three things from all the material he saw? Uh, Go ask Sonu. He did. The third appendix, Appendix C, and I should say all these three appendices are key to understanding Jung's encounter with Gnostic mythology during this period. The third supplement, Appendix C, reproduces an entry found in Jung's Black Book 5, dated 16 January 1916. It is an astounding text in which the feminine voice of Jung's soul reveals to him a story that will be recognized by every student of Gnosticism as a foundational myth of the tradition, the myth of Sophia and the Demiurge. January 16, 
1916. As we noted last night, over the last century, several scholars of Gnosticism have argued that absent a myth of a demiurge, of the demiurge, a, and Sophia, a mythology should not properly be categorized as a Gnostic mythology, at least in its most classical sense. And this subject has is, is colored some readings of this little Gnostic text by Jung called The Seven Sermons to the Dead. People say there's no, there's no demiurge in here. There's a figure named Abraxas, but it isn't clear that he's the demiurge in Gnostic mythology. And so they've argued that the seven sermons are not really a Gnostic mythology because there's no demiurge. Well, in this vision, it's made clear that the Abraxas mentioned in the seven sermons is indeed the demiurge of classical Gnostic mythology. And so let me read you what Jung wrote, what the voice, the Sophianic voice, spoke to him, and he wrote in his journal, 16 January, 1916. This is, these are her words. It's all in the appendix, Appendix C of the Red Book. Quote, You should worship only one god. The other gods are unimportant. Abraxas is to be feared. Therefore, it was a deliverance when he separated himself from me. Now note, the soul here is taking the voice of Sophia. She speaks of when he separated himself from me. Remember the demiurge separated herself from Sophia in that myth? This is Sophia talking about the separation of the demiurge from her. So she says, it was a deliverance when he separated himself from me. You do not need to seek after him, the demiurge. You do not need to seek after him. He will find you, like Eros. He is the god of the cosmos, extremely powerful and fearful. He is the creative drive. He is form and formation. Just as much matter and force, therefore he is above all light and dark gods. He tears away souls and casts them into procreation. He is the creative and the created. He is the God who always renews himself in days, in months, in years, in human life, in ages, in peoples, in the living, in heavenly bodies. He compels. He is unsparing. If you worship him, you increase his power over you. Therefore, it becomes unbearable. You will have a dreadful trouble getting clear of him. So, Remember him. Do not worship him. Do not worship him. But also, do not imagine that you can flee him, since he is all around you. <clears throat> you must be in the middle of life, surrounded by death on all sides, stretched out like one crucified. You hang in him, the fearful, the overpowering. But you have in you the one God. The wonderful, beautiful, and kind. The solitary, star-like, unmoving. He who is older and wiser than the Father. He who has a safe hand, who leads you among all the darknesses and death scares of dreadful Abraxas. He gives joy and peace, since he is beyond death and beyond what is subject to change. He is no servant and no friend of Abraxas. End quote. Jung recognized the Gnostic provenance of this January 1916 apparition, this voice. A Sophianic voice had declared to him the fundamental Gnostic assertion of the Demiurge, and then the assertion, you have in you the one God, the wonderful, beautiful, and kind, the solitary, star-like, and unmoving. And Jung turned to that star, that indwelling imminence of image, and it became his life's guide. Simon Magus, Philemon, and Helena, and C.G. Jung. Intriguingly, as I mentioned in the last session, at the conclusion of Libra Novus, it is disclosed that Philemon, Jung's Guru, his spirit guide, as he called him, who he walked in his garden with, prominently mentioned in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, 
was the ancient Gnostic teacher, Simon Magus, at least in the imaginative form it, he took in Jung's diary record. And you'll remember that in the story of Simon and his consort, Helena, Jung found an image of his own experience with a protein feminine power he came to identify with Sophia. Simon, the father of all heresy, the first Gnostic, became Jung's Philemon. Simon, Philemon, and Jung were all lovers of the soul. They had heard her, they had met her, Sophia, Epinoia, in images of soul, of the soul. And two years after the beginning of this journey in Liber Novus, Jung was placing his visionary experience into an interpretive form impregnated with this reading of Gnostic mythology. In his journal entry from January 1916, the soul speaks to him in a vocabulary of Gnostic myth. Two weeks later, the same vocabulary enters into his initial journal formulation of the seven sermons to the dead. Septum sermones ad mortos. His guide, Philemon, Oh, these he transcribes. And then in the summer of 1916, his guide, Philemon, is revealed to be Simon Magus. Jung's myth had met its rhizome, and he knew it. He knew it. From these events... It should be evident why, between 1916 on for 13 years, Jung was reading about the Gnostics, Gnostic textual evidence. Ultimately, he determined that there had not been enough textual material surviving in his time for him to tie his psychology in commentary to the Gnostic texts. It simply was culturally not possible. The textual evidence was not adequate. It was adequate enough for him to see that there was a relationship with his experience, but he was not likely to be able to convince many other people. In 1945, the Najamadi material was found, a vast cache of Gnostic material. And this material greatly supplements uh, what was available previously. It doesn't contradict any of Jung's um, impressions of the Gnostic material. It greatly amplifies the primary material that could be used to support those ideas. This is the sort of stuff that Dr. Ribby, Alfred Ribby, was talking about in his book called The Search for Roots, and now we're now preparing the second volume of that work, which is called Zeitenwende, The Turning of Time, which is a much more technical work on this Gnostic material, and that'll be out hopefully in a couple of years. It's going to be translated by the same people who are translating the Red Book and the Black Books. I'm working on that project right now. So, Let me just jump to the pictures. Two years after beginning the journey of Liber Novus, Jung had seen this Gnostic connection. He had been working on the transcription of his manuscript into the Red Book. In the first year or two or three, he produced quite a few pages of what was done in the Red Book. And then by 1920, 22, 23, the rate of his transcription was slowing down. He had been dealing with this stuff now for over a decade. And the Red Book never was finished. Between 1924 and 1930, he only completed a few more pages. Most of it was done at that point. In 1923, his mother died. It was in that year that in his journal, the soul stopped talking to him. It was done. This experience that had been going on, it stopped. In the black books, the last black book, uh, the, the, there are a couple entries after about 1924, I'm told. I haven't seen them, obviously. They're not published yet. They'll be out in a couple of years. But that there are a couple uh, entries in which the soul appears, but they really taper off. It sort of is done in 1924. And Jung is pretty much done with this eruption of vision and his commentary upon it. He's about to move on into another phase of his work, which is essentially finding analogs developing conceptual psychology to relate to this perceptual event and finding its analogs in history. Ultimately, 
he tried to find it in Gnosticism. He thought he did find it in alchemy, alchemical tradition. He also turned to Eastern traditions, to Taoism, to Buddhist material. He turned to the meditations of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Patanjali's, all of these things, Kundalini Yoga, all of these things he was looking at for images of this imaginal realm that he had met. But he was pretty much done with the Red Book. In this is page 154 and page 155 of Jung's Red Book. After these two pages, only a few more, another dozen or so, would be transcribed. Then, right before his death, and a few years before his death, he went back to it and he put in some more pages. He tried, he wanted, right before, in the years before he died, he wanted to finish this thing. So he went back to the manuscript and tried to write in more. But if you look, the hand gets weak. He never finished the coloration, and basically it stops in mid sentence on page 189. It's done. He was too old, his eyes too weak, his hand too tired. It was done. On page 154 and 155 of Libra Novus, Jung painted his summation. And I do believe these are the summation images of the Red Book. These are the last two great and beautiful illustrations. On page 154, we have Philemon. At the top of this illustration in Greek, way up here, and this illustration has been printed for years. It appeared in a, in a book back in the 80s called Jung in Word and Image, I think. And I saw the image then, and I read the Greek then. And what the Greek says is, Beloved Philemon, father of the prophets. Beloved Philemon, father of the prophets. To the side, facing it on the succeeding page, a feminine image. At the top of that image, it says, Dei sapientia in mysterio. The wisdom of God in mystery. Sapientia, Sophia. Sapientia, Latin, Sophia, Greek. The wisdom of God in mystery. These were painted in 1924 in his Red Book. These two facing portraits mark principal companions met during his visionary journey, and this is his tribute to them. They form a thematic conclusion to his transcription of of Livernovus into the red leather folio volume. Around the time Jung finished these images, he had begun construction of his tower at Bollingen. Above the door of the tower at Bollingen, he carved a dedication, consecrating the place. It reads, Philemonus Sacrum, the shrine of Philemon. On a bedroom wall upstairs in the tower, in large mural format, he again painted painted an image of Philemon, essentially that image. It goes from ceiling to floor, corner to corner, an entire wall of his bedroom. Above that painting, he added an appellation also. It says, Philemon, the prophet's primal father. Jung obviously had a formidable relationship with this figure, Philemon, who, we find, was also anciently known as Simon Magus. No less complex was his relationship with a protein feminine power met in the guise of the soul. Philemon had a bride. Her name was Baucus. Simon Magus had a bride. Her name was Helena. Logos had a syzygy. Her name was Sophia. He named her in this picture, Sophia, wisdom of God in a mystery. Both figures integrate 
themselves within Jung's perception of his Gnostic heritage. So, based on his reading of ancient texts, a task undertaken intensely beginning in 1915, Jung judged that Gnostics of the first centuries had experienced an imaginal reality that he also had met. But there existed another and deeper perception behind Jung's special relationship with Gnostic antiquity, and that has not yet received wide attention. And I suggest it was the most important issue Jung identified. Connecting him to this tradition, it placed the ancient Gnosis in a unique temporal situation relative to all other later manifestations of the tradition, such as those in medieval alchemy and Kabbalah and other movements, heretical movements, emerging during the second millennia, second millennium of the current epoch. Not only had the Gnostics met and engaged a psychic reality, emerging from the depths, in Jung's opinion, but they had undergone their experience of this mythopoetic power at a uniquely transformative moment in the evolution of humanity, of human consciousness, the threshold of a new age, a new aeon. And so now, 2,000 years later, had Carl Gustav Jung, or so it seemed to him, imaginally. Jung saw humanity facing an epical task. We stand before a pivotal moment in our story, one of the key moments in all of human story, a moment such as only occurs in millennia, a moment such as has probably only occurred three or so times before, in our recorded human history. We stand before this pivotal moment in our story. And as Jung said, quote, we also need Sophia. We need the Sophia that Job was seeking. The prior anamnesis, or remembering of Sophia, had come at the threshold of the Christian aeon, as witnessed by the Gnostics who heard her tale 2,000 years ago. That story had been sustained in the Kabbalistic tradition, in the image of Shekinah. It had been sustained in alchemy, in the image of Anima Mundi. However, over these succeeding millennia of the Christian epoch, the experience of her had been generally excised, forgotten, suppressed. Jung felt that now Sophia was returning. In Pope Pius XII's 1950 pronouncement of the Assumption of the Virgin, Jung identified a modern dogmatic evolution that evidenced Sophia's myth awakening to new life. Her story was alive. Her story was awakening imaginatively. The story was living. Dogma, religion, was responding to the life of this story, awakening again. For Jung, it was a sign of the times. The pivotal nature of this time, this kairos, this right time. And it was an independent confirmation of what had happened to him in his encounter with the feminine, with the Sophianic spirit in Libra Novus many years before. In Aeon, which Jung finished in 1950, he asserted, for the Gnostics, and this is their real circuit, excuse me, and this is their real secret, the psyche exists as a source of knowledge. That statement was succinctly summarized, that statement succinctly summarized Jung's defining perception about the nature of gnosis. His own experience was the foundation for his definition. Beginning in 1913, Jung turned to the soul seeking knowledge. It came. What he saw and heard was incredible. It stood beyond belief. He himself could not believe it. As he said, I do not want to believe it. I do not need to believe it. 
nor could I believe it. How could, believe, how could one believe such? My mind would need to be totally confused to believe such things. Given their nature, they are most improbable. But, he says, what could not be believed, he now knew. And I quote from Libra Novus, not with reference to the opinions of the ancients or this or that authority, but because I have experienced it. It has happened thus in me. And it most certainly happened in a way that I neither expected nor wished for. End quote. Jung did not use the writings of the Gnostics, their mythology or psychology, as sources of his psychology. He turned to their accounts, seeking confirmatory resources that supported his observations about the mythopoetic depths underlying our conscious awareness. Whatever his sympathies, Jung was not an ancient Gnostic. Nor could he mold himself, model himself in that archaic form. He was a modern man. He was perhaps even the first truly modern man. Establishing the link between the Gnosis of old and his new praxis was, however, an undertaking with a hidden significance for Jung. In Liber Novus, Carl Gustav Jung received a vocation that burdened him, burdened him with an epical task, as he wrote, to give birth to the ancient in a new time is creation. This is the creation of the new, and that redeems me. Salvation is resolution of the task. The task is to give birth to the old in a new time. To understand more than the this and that of Jung, it is imperative we now ponder the way he worked, the redemptive task of giving birth to the old in a new time. It is a complex enterprise. It demands the conjoint consideration of old traditions and its new book. In the labor, many prior assumptions and obscuring accretions will need to be stripped away. The nature of Jungian studies will be changed, definitely will be changed. Nonetheless, by delving into the depths of Jung's relationship with Gnostic tradition, and most importantly, I think, with the myth of Sophia, we will unearth a key that unlocks transformative perspectives on Jung's hermeneutics of creative imagination and on his vision of a coming new chapter in our human story. Thank you.